Hey everybody, before we start today's episode, I would like to remind you that I recently started a gaming review channel. You can find the link to that channel in the description down below, it is labeled Kanoa Reviews. On that channel I review games, both old and new, and you can even request certain reviews by commenting on the videos on there. Please check it out, and if you like what you see, please consider subscribing and supporting me on that channel. Thanks, and enjoy the rest of the episode. The world, in its almost entirety, looked towards the United Kingdom, a nation that had bestowed power unto the crown once more. The House of Commons was a relic of an unstable and uncertain past. Britain's House of Lords was granted more power and sway within the national government. The War of the Six Armies, an ironic name now, as no longer six factions were involved, continued on. Though several opposing revolutionary factions earned some victories here and there, Gaddafi still remained the overall aggressor and victor in most conflicts. In China, something very interesting happened. Li Zhanzhu condemned the USSR, obviously resulting in a decrease of relations between the two nations. Though it of course did not result in war immediately, it could be the first crack in the dam that would eventually unleash a tidal wave. What was more important was China's next move. Xiang Zhu's goal here was not yet clear. Whether he just wanted to claim more independence for his beloved China, gain new possibilities by making treaties with non-communist nations, or indeed eventually wage war with the Red Giant. Neighboring India pretended like their noses were bleeding and continued with their everyday routine. In this case, focusing on steel incentives. The nation of Utah, led by Mike Leavitt, also looked towards Asia. It was clear to many that the smaller nations that were apart from the three giants at the coasts would need to depend on help from other continents. The fascist Montana did the same, but instead looked towards Africa. Maybe the turmoil caused by the war of the six armies created some potential to be gained in their eyes. And then on the 9th of October 2010, something happened that many expected, but no one saw coming so blatantly. A large part that was ruled by Angela Davis's UAPR rebelled against its government under the name Cascadia. And with a freakish move, captured and occupied many different cities and army bases for miles and miles. Blood was about to be spilled amongst American brothers on American soil once again. The face of Cascadia was what appeared to be harmless in the form of Greg Walden, but he was only supposed to be the front man and in reality, the creative minds behind the efficient army coup were done by multiple high-ranking generals who fundamentally disagreed with the way Davis was strengthening her grip over the past years. Then by October 11th, another army fell in the War of the Six Armies. It was now pretty clear that the remaining revolutionary parties stood no chance against Gaddafi, but they were not ready to throw in the towel just like that, and so the conflict would rage on for quite a while. It gave Gaddafi hope, as it would surely increase his own political and military power, seeing as he overcame all odds and presumably would emerge the victor here. The people would think twice to revolt, seeing as a civil war on this scale resulted in nothing but bloodshed without change. In America, the war between Cascadia and the UAPR had now fully started as well. With a predictable move, the fighting force of Cascadia first headed west as to secure the harbors and ports to provide incoming supplies from backers elsewhere. In the first week of the conflict along the west coast of America, almost 200 lives were lost. These losses were quite evenly divided amongst the two opposing factions. Neighboring nations like Arizona did not seem to be scared about the unsettling conflict to their western borders. Some might even say that they hoped for the UAPR to lose. Utah made it very clear also that they went along their own way and would stay outside of this conflict, as did Montana do likewise. Some were not impressed with the display of absence from the neighboring nations, as this would be the opportune moment in some people's eyes to strike at Davis's regime. In Africa things were different. The Socialist Union of Algeria, which stood next to the area in which the War of the Six Armies had been raging on for months now, invested heavily into drones. Probably to closely follow what happened to their east, 
but also all around, as with a new revolutionary war unleashed in America, more countries and examples could follow. Though conflict was nowhere close to being on a global or continental scale, these months in late 2010 were important as moves were made on the chessboard by many leaders. The UK on their own terms had important decisions to make in the future as whom to trust and side with in combat to come. China for the moment looked towards America. Li Zhanzhu thought that the turmoil brewing in the West could stir up the hornet's nest elsewhere making various parties open to negotiations in their benefits. This was all done on the down low, as to not upset Moscow. In the beginning of November, another army fell in Libya, and Gaddafi was now only facing two opponents. He was sure victory would be his, and he was so confident that he started to concentrate on other matters, like rebuilding the nation and reinstating people in office who he could be assured would be loyal to him. The commotion surrounding all these revolutions worldwide did indeed spark other conflicts, including in Syria, where the Socialist Republic and the Kingdom finally clashed. The battle between Cascadia and the UAPR, of which people at first thought would remain a conflict on a smaller scale, had by now turned into a full-blown war with over 3,000 people killed. Not only that, Cascadia was winning territory in the north, and Davis had trouble keeping the front line at ease. She spent so much time securing her own position politically that she failed to adhere to the nation's military needs. And as the world burned on multiple continents, it was Britain which decided to throw some positivity towards its own people. Maybe it was an act of diversion to assure its own people that similar revolutions were out of the question, ironic if one were to look at the recent coup. News got out that the second in line to the throne was to marry his long-term girlfriend, the prince asked Middleton to marry him during a private holiday in Kenya in the previous month and had, the royal press office stressed, asked her father's permission. Kate Middleton said during a brief conference at St. James's Palace that the prince had been a true romantic and was a loving boyfriend and very supportive of her in good times and also through bad times. The formal statement from Clarence House said William's father, Prince Charles, was delighted. At the end of that month, news arrived on the other side of the globe as word got out that the President of the American Republic, Donald Rumsfeld, had just won his second term as Commander-in-Chief, the final he would be able to hold. Celebrations throughout the country persisted well into the night and other candidates took little time to concede after initial results came in. It was fascinating to see. It was fascinating to see, since Rumsfeld kept frighteningly still during the last few months as some believed he focused on his re-election rather than external issues. But now with his final term, Rumsfeld seemed more determined than ever. The May Day attack to the nation to his north and the uprising in the communist nation to his west made Rumsfeld feel certain that nationalist values once again should be embraced by his own people. Then on November 29, 2010, the earlier announced change in power for the House of Lords went into effect. Sweeping new powers for the Britain's upper house were declared late in the afternoon by Prince Philip. While the Queen was on holiday in Wales, the Prince gathered support of various barons to enact reform allowing these powers. Now the House could dictate national and foreign policy, with the approval of Her Majesty of course. Finally the remnants of the old House of Commons have been swept away. With more of the royal elitists backing the Queen, the next step would be the new Privy Council. With this, overall construction and trade would increase drastically, which was essential for the island nation which basically stood alone, detached from Europe both physical and on paper. By the beginning of December it looked as if the Cascadian Revolution had failed as they lost loads of territory and battles over the past weeks. But many were still willing to fight for the cause, especially since Davis would have trouble reinforcing her men whereas Cascadia received supplies and men voluntarily from neighbors to the east. Though for the moment Britain seemed like one of the most peaceful places on earth, the Queen and her government knew all too well that it too was a ticking time bomb. Research in weapons development would be essential and thus new treaties were made for the royal ordnance. Gaddafi at the moment wasn't even concerned anymore with the so-called War of the Six Armies, as now only one petty rebellion was left at the eastern border. In the meantime, he mingled amongst corporations for financial aid to help the rebuild of his country. 
it would be an awesome victory over five enemy armies that would go down in history and immortality. Angela Davis showcased similar standings as she was currently in the process of dealing with the increase in educational funding rather than the Civil War. And indeed, though Cascadia had lost much territory since their first emergence, in reality, the UAPR had lost way more men in this overall conflict. More than 8,000 were killed, and together with the rebels, this war had already cost more than 12,000 people their lives. The world was not in an overall war yet, but cracks started to show here and there. It was still too early to see what was coming, if a storm was approaching or not.